the Parkinson's Disease Foundation 8th PD Expert Briefing Series, Diagnosis PD, Now What? Managing the First Few Years of the Parkinson's. I'm your host, Dr. Jim Beck, not Robin Elliott, who's not available today, and I want to be here for the entire discussion. Um, I've got a couple announcements I want to make before we get started. First, I want to say that these webinars are not created in isolation, um, which is why I'm really pleased to announce that this series has been designed in collaboration with members of the Alliance of Independent Regional Parkinson's Organizations, we call AIRPO for short. I must also say that this webinar wouldn't be possible without the support of our sponsors. Those include AbbVie, Acadia Pharmaceuticals, and Lundbeck. Thank you very much for your generous support. The PowerPoint slide deck that's going to be part of this presentation can be downloaded on the viewing page that you're looking at right now. Um, it's in the lower left-hand corner, and it says there's a download slides link. So you can download a PDF file anytime during this talk, so you can go back and forward if you like. If you're a health professional, I want to let you know that we have uh, the ability to earn one free CEU through the American Society on Aging. If you registered as a health professional and indicated that you would like CEUs, you'll receive an email by the end of today with steps on how to collect your CEU. You have just 30 days, which is until Thursday, April 6th, to collect your um, free CEU. I want to let you know that we also have uh, about 1,000 people um, who are signed up and on the line. So um, I'm really pleased to introduce our speaker, Dr. Sisketu Kandar. He's medical director of Kaiser Permanente Northern California Movement Disorders Program um, and part of the Kaiser Permanente Sacramento Medical Center. Dr. Kandar is a neurologist who specializes in the training of movement disorders. And that includes not only Parkinson's disease, but a whole breadth of movement disorders, such as tremor, dystonia, and Huntington's disease. He's a medical director of a team of specialists who also focus on the surgical treatment of people living with PD. He evaluates people with, with Parkinson's and particularly looking for those who might benefit from bot botulinum toxin injections. Dr. Kondar received his medical degree from St. George's University School of Medicine and completed his residency at State University of New York in upstate. He completed his fellowship in Parkinson's disease and movement disorders at University of California, San Francisco, where he lives with his wife and three kids. Um, Dr. Kandar is a board-certified neurologist and who enjoys and uh, has a penchant for travel, uh, going to China uh, for the first time later this year. So uh, with that introduction, I would like to uh, welcome Dr. Kandar um, to our presentation. Dr. Kandar? Thank you very much, Jim, and I want to thank the PDF for inviting me here to speak today. I also want to thank you all for joining us on this WebEx today. So today, we're going to be speaking about diagnosis PD, now what, managing the first few years with Parkinson's disease. I'd like to admit that there are no financial disclosures, but I do want to emphasize that um, just between me and you, we are going to China later this year, but it is a surprise for my family, so please don't tell them if you see them. On a serious note, the care approach and the views expressed today here are my own and a reflection of how I practice at my institution, but also one that has served my patient population well. Our learning objectives today are number one, to identify a care team that can help a person to better navigate Parkinson's, learn tips for effectively working with your healthcare team, and to understand how a patient empowerment can lead to improved quality of life. Let's start with the diagnosis. We all can appreciate that the diagnosis rests, for the most part, on clinical judgment and diagnostic accuracy. This requires a specific amount of clinical testing. Those diagnoses are based on clinical grounds without any formal blood tests or any formal imaging that can definitively offer that diagnosis. So therefore, there's no objectifying metric or no accepted biomarker that's universally accepted when it comes to making and confirming a diagnosis with Parkinson's. Oftentimes, this can be unsettling to people with Parkinson's and their family, which often leads to seeking out second opinions. It is not uncommon in my practice for patients to have jumped from physician to physician, number one, in order to get that second opinion to confirm the diagnosis, but also affirmation that this truly is the diagnosis. So this boils down to 
who has the clinical acumen to appropriately make this diagnosis? Who typically makes the diagnosis? Is it primary medicine? For example, your general practitioner? Would it be a neurologist? How about a movement disorder neurologist? Or oftentimes, it's family and friends and coworkers that might be suspicious of a diagnosis. In my opinion, primary medicine may certainly be well equipped to make the diagnosis. However, it probably is much more appropriate for the neurologist to make a diagnosis. For example, in my institution, any time a primary care physician is suspicious of a diagnosis of Parkinson's, irregardless if that's truly the diagnosis or not, it demands an immediate referral to a neurologist in order to help confirm those suspicions or to reroute what those suspicions were. Oftentimes, that neurologist may actually have background training in movement disorders. So this brings me to what is a movement disorder neurologist? Jim had mentioned earlier in this presentation that I'm a movement disorder neurologist. Now, contrary to popular belief, it does not mean that we are necessarily good dancers. However, a movement disorder neurologist is one who's had specialized training in diagnosing and treating movement disorders. That means after medical school and a year of internship and three years of residency training in this country, we go on to do anywhere from one to three years of specialized and focused training in the field of movement disorders. This includes treating and evaluating patients with Parkinson's disease, tremor, and other involuntary movements. I find that in my job, my responsibility is to connect patients' uh, Parkinson's symptoms, see how those symptoms have evolved, couple that with my observation of the patient and my examination to come up with a patterned diagnosis. Oftentimes, I'll sit watching the patient and observing their movements to see whether they jive with what the patient is expressing. Now, I understand and appreciate that how they may be doing in my clinical office may not necessarily be a reflection of how they do at home. However, I have to be mindful of not only that, but also my examination that day. I may then go on to order appropriate tests in order to rule out other possible conditions I may even consider medical treatment when it becomes necessary. Now you will see on this slide that I've highlighted three lines, pattern a diagnosis, educate, and connect the patient with Parkinson local resources. I find that those three are my greatest responsibilities. So oftentimes when patients are referred to me, they've already seen one or two other neurologists before me. So therefore, I'm actually been tasked with taking all of their ideas and trying to pattern one single diagnosis. But I find that I would be remiss not to educate the patient on what that diagnosis means for them and what the course trajectory could potentially mean. That also means to map out a roadmap for a patient so they understand what the next steps are. In addition to that, I think it's also my responsibility to connect the patient with local Parkinson resources because I know very well that I'm not going to be able to educate them entirely on their condition during the brief time that we may have together in the office. Therefore, I may require and lean and shoulder on other local as well as national as well as international resources for the patient to be able to educate themselves further on their condition. In an ideal world, every person with this condition should be followed by a movement disorder specialist, especially given what I just told you. In that world, a neurologist would be the main person steering the care plan with the bipartisan support from that person with Parkinson's. They, in addition to that, they would have a full team to help support their motor and non-motor needs. But in reality, and according to the National Parkinson Foundation here in the States, up to 40% of patients with Parkinson's do not routinely see a neurologist. And less than 25% of patients ever see a movement disorder specialist. Given the complexity of this condition, I find that um, <clears throat> un 
unacceptable. So things I think have to change um, to where the main provider is not the primary care physician and at the very least the neurologist with some guidance from the movement disorder specialist. Dr. Jean Charcot, a French neurologist and the father of modern neurology, once quoted, to learn how to treat a disease, one must learn how to recognize it. So let's review Parkinson's disease. We all know that it's a progressive disorder and that it's neurodegenerative and that the cardinal motor symptoms include resting tremor, bradykinesia, otherwise known as slowness in movement, rigidity, otherwise known as stiffness in movement, and postural instability, which basically equates to imbalance. Oftentimes, it is these motor symptoms that lead one to the suspicion of the diagnosis. And they're the ones that offer the clues that a neurologist would need to improve the diagnostic accuracy. But what if you only present with one or two of these symptoms, but not all of them? Oftentimes, the diagnosis can be a bit obscure, which often can lead to patients jumping from physician to physician in order to solidify that diagnosis. Are there <clears throat> other clues that might lead to a more improved diagnostic accuracy. Over the past 10 to 15 years, we have identified four preclinical non-motor symptoms in Parkinson's. Now, this means that these symptoms here may have predated the development of the tremor, may have predated the development of the bradykinesia or rigidity. Oftentimes, not understanding that they're related to Parkinson's. But when a patient presents with only one or two of the motor symptoms, asking specific questions about these preclinical non-motor symptoms can give us um, more supportive evidence that this is truly Parkinson's disease. Oftentimes, patients will report that they have lost their sense of smell. Of course, oftentimes patients don't readily give up that information without the physician asking that information. And this is known as anosmia, loss of sense of smell. Oftentimes, patients may have anxiety or depression predating their motor symptoms. Constipation is a very common motor, uh, non-motor symptom in Parkinson's disease. And this is sometimes evaluated by gastroenterology physicians who will metric a colonic transit time. How long does it take for stool to pass from the small into the large intestine and finally into the rectum? You don't often need to get a colonic transit time in order to make a diagnosis of constipation. Sleep disturbances are very common in Parkinson's disease and usually take the form of two things, either restless leg syndrome or something called REM sleep behavior disorder. Let's start with restless leg syndrome. Restless leg syndrome is when somebody feels an abnormal sensation, typically in their lower limbs, usually in the evening hours of the day when their legs are more sedentary and they're not walking around. It's hard and often difficult to describe what those sensations are. And then people feel the compulsion to move the limb, to stretch the limb, to massage the limb, or to get up and pace about in order to relieve themselves of that abnormal sensation. Oftentimes, this disrupts their sleep or can even wake them up out of sleep. A good third of patients tend to have this genetically linked. On the other hand, REM sleep behavior disorder is a disruption in the sleep cycle. So if you look at our sleep cycle, we tend to cycle between dream sleep and deep sleep. Dream sleep is when you're actively dreaming, but your body for the most part is fairly limp. And deep sleep is when you're not dreaming at all, your mind is drawing a blank, but your body is able to toss and turn. Oftentimes, these get mixed up to where a Parkinson patient is able to actively act out their dreams. Oftentimes, this is not something that the patient themselves will be able to report, 
This is something that the bed partner reports. And the bed partner may express that a patient is flailing about in the middle of the night, often putting themselves at harm's way or even the bed partner at harm's way. Many times patients will scream out in the middle of the night. If a thorough history is taken from a patient who may have only one or two motor symptoms, but by asking the pertinent questions relevant to these non-motor symptoms, we have a higher diagnostic accuracy. Certain studies suggest that patients with REM sleep behavior disorder who also have constipation, who also have a nosemia, and may or may not have the non-motor, the motor symptoms rather, would have a higher likelihood of developing Parkinson's disease. I'd like to take a moment to go ahead and express a quote given by Dr. James Parkinson himself. As we all may be aware, this is, marks the 200th year anniversary of Dr. James Parkinson's original manuscript, The Shaking Palsy, which was published in The Lancet in 1817. It is where he beautifully describes the condition and gives it a name, calling it the shaking palsy or paralysis agitans. In it, he goes on to say that it seldom happens that the agitation, in this case he's, he's um, referring to the tremor, so it seldom happens that the agitation extends beyond the arms within the first two years, which period, therefore, if we were deposed, disposed to divide the disease into stages, might be said to comprise the first stage. So what Dr. Parkinson is doing here is subdividing the trajectory of Parkinson's disease. Something that we like to refer to as the honeymoon period is what he's describing here in this passage. So what is the honeymoon period? Honeymoon period really is the time from diagnosis extending about three to five years thereafter. Usually, it begins shortly after that time of diagnosis when a patient is on low-dose Parkinson medications and the patient is, for the most part, functionally doing really well. This marks an opportunistic time, yet a very vulnerable time for, for patients. I'd like to emphasize that last part, a vulnerable time for patients. And why is that? Usually it uh, leads to a delay in medication or other treatment options. Oftentimes patients or providers assume that patients are doing really well, so there are a lot of infrequent medical assessments and medical engagements. Patients think they're doing well, physicians assume so, and patients are not seen for longer periods of time. This leads to the phenomenon of episodic crisis-driven care. So later in the course of disease, patients tend to uh, see their physician or their provider more frequently because things have gotten much worse. So are there things that we can set in motion, put in place in that honeymoon period that can divert that episodic crisis-driven care? I'd like to think so. So another piece of the same passage from Dr. James Parkinson is that in this period that I like to refer to as the honeymoon period, it is very probable that remedial means might be employed with success. And even if unfortunately deferred to a later period, they might then arrest the farther progress of the disease. Was Dr. Parkinson speaking to traditional medical treatments at the time or exercise? Now, Dr. Parkinson was a surgeon. His father was a surgeon. His son inherited his practice from him. So he's a long successional line of surgeons, medical providers in London back in the early 1800s. He was a huge proponent of healthy living. So I'd like to think that he was speaking towards exercise and well-being. This was taken from our colleagues, um, uh, Dr. Hackney from Emory um, University in Atlanta, Georgia. You can see along the y-axis, which is the vertical axis, we're looking at cognitive and motor function. And along the x-axis, we're looking at Parkinson's disease progression. 
The solid lines refer to motor function in black and cognitive function in red without exercise. And it's been postulated that with exercise, you can see a steep improvement in both motor function and cognitive function over time, leading, assumingly, to improved quality of life. I find this slide very meaningful because oftentimes we forget the value of exercise earlier in the course of disease. We forget that activity alone is not enough and certainly does not replace a structured exercise program. It is not uncommon for patients to say, well, I'm quite active, I do a lot of yard work, I am working a lot when I'm at work, so why do I need to do additional exercise in order to help improve my symptoms? And I think that this here speaks to the contrary. So it brings me to developing a care team. I propose that the patient being the center of what is required for their well-being and their quality of life requires at a minimum four things to help support their needs. At the top of the concentric circle, you'll see primary care. You always need your primary care physician, your general practitioner, to help manage things that are not necessarily related to Parkinson's. Oftentimes, patients who are um, sort of in the prime of their life may have other comorbid conditions, and oftentimes what happens is, is that the primary care physician or the neurologist may only blame the Parkinson's for any symptoms that may show up or appear. And I would expect that the primary care physician will help to parse some of that out, what is actually related to Parkinson's and what not might necessarily be related. If you look towards the left side of that concentric circle, we have the neurologist in that care team. That seems somewhat obvious given the fact that this is a neurodegenerative, somewhat complex neurological condition. On the right side of that concentric circle is physical therapy. Now, historically, physical therapy has always been an additional provider to help on an intermittent basis but I'm proposing that the physical therapist actually be part of the care team. This is something that's typically new to the physical therapy world for the physical therapist to have a panel no differently than the neurologist or primary care physician. And at the bottom of that concentric circle is the support network that might be recruited um, that's outside of healthcare delivery. So what are the requirements of people to be part of your care team. For me, there are four requirements, expertise and experience. Now, we spoke about that before a bit because this leads to improved diagnostic accuracy. Just because you've made a diagnosis of Parkinson's doesn't mean you have to not be recognizing other symptoms of Parkinson's that tend to be part of natural progression. And this is more likely to happen in someone who has more expertise in Parkinson's disease and certainly has the volume and experience to be able to speak to it. Let's jump down to network. I mentioned how specialists typically recruit from an expert network panel. This is very important when it comes to a movement disorder neurologist or a physical therapist who's trained in Parkinson's disease because they may actually have certain resources at their disposal that may not necessarily be aware to a general neurologist or to a primary care physician. So the care team requirements should have, each of those people and members of that care team should have the right expertise to manage your condition, the right experience for you to feel trustworthy and comfortable with their care, the right network to be able to recruit from because this condition cannot be treated by any one individual, and that leads me to passion. Now, I did not add this word arbitrarily. Wouldn't you want someone who will seek the right answers for you or take the right risks to help you take those next steps in your care delivery? Well, basically and essentially would fight for you. That's what I call passion. So you don't want a complacent uh, provider. You want one that's going to fight on your behalf and on all of their patients' behalf. So this gives us a little bit more detail 
as to what my expectations are for the core care team. Let's start with the primary care physician on the upper right-hand corner. I expect them to manage all non-Parkinson concerns. So you should routinely be meeting with your primary care physician at the very least on a year-to-year -year basis. It's not uncommon for, physician, for, for uh, patients, or anyone for that matter, to miss several years because they think they're doing well. But I think it's mandatory and important for anybody with a chronic condition to routinely follow up, even as a well visit, with their primary care physician. I think that the neurologist in the upper left-hand corner should be routinely followed up with as well to determine when is it appropriate to start medication, when is it appropriate to adjust medication, and of course, to provide ongoing education. I think it's very important for the patient to continually see their physical therapist at least a few times per year, and this is to establish a structured exercise program. And then the last thing is to establish a sense of community through social networks. Now, that's not to say that that core team is your only team. I think that there can be a larger care team depending on a patient's needs. As we all understand that this condition is somewhat of a designer disease. Everybody has slightly different symptoms, may have had symptoms come on at different times, may respond to medication differently, and may have a different course trajectory than the next person, which then kind of begs the question that the ancillary larger care team may be different from patient to patient. However, the core team should always stay the same. So you can see that middle circle, that deeper circle, is you and the core team. And I emphasized you because you should be the one to pull the reins. You should be the one to navigate who I want to recruit at what time. Now, other members of a larger care team might include ST and OT refers to speech therapy and occupational therapy. Mental health I put in this category because those three are ones that we recruit from often, but not necessary all the time. Maybe to a slightly lesser degree, we'll recruit urologists or GI specialists or even neurosurgery if you're thinking about potential surgery for Parkinson's disease. And then lastly, the community-based programs that are oftentimes available to us, but oftentimes not understood where they exist. Now, how can you effectively work together? It's not just a matter of expecting that these care providers are going to work on your behalf, but making them work on your behalf. So what do I expect from this particular care team? Number one, there has to be a philosophical change and shift from traditional medical hierarchy. See, long gone are the days of parental medical approach. I expect a, bar, a bipartisan relationship. I expect some dissolution of this hierarchy. We're all on the same page. If we want to improve your care, we both want the same thing, then we both should have equal say in how that happens. It would be my job as the neurologist to express my expertise on what I think might be best for you. But it's equally your job to accept whether that is the way in which you want to move forward. This requires you to educate yourself to own part of this condition, to understand that this is your condition to be ferried around with. So that involves a certain degree of partnering with your care team, and oftentimes that may require in this day and age to leverage telemedicine. Given our healthcare demands, particularly in the United States, leveraging telemedicine makes a lot of sense. It is not often convenient to be able to come into the office uh, or to be able to wait for a doctor's appointment or a provider's appointment because your symptoms still require immediate care. So for that, email, telephone, even video appointments are becoming much more popular and something that you may want to consider if your particular institution or where you get your care adopts these particular teleprograms. This brings me to my philosophy on a successful treatment strategy. And I think it's fairly simple. 
it involves three pieces, and I think they're all equally important. Number one is right diagnosis with the right dopaminergic treatment. And I think a lot of that responsibility is shouldered by the neurologist. That the neurologist is to make sure and give you the confidence that this is the right diagnosis and when is it appropriate to go ahead and start meds. The second is the physical therapy and the exercise piece, but the part that I actually already spaced apart is the patient ownership piece. And oftentimes, this piece gets a bit myopic. And I think it's important for patients to accept that this is the diagnosis, and once that exception has happened, that we can move forward with an appropriate treatment strategy. This was adopted, actually, from one of our key neuro PTs here at Kaiser Permanente in Northern California. For that, we have to circle back as to what our expectations of a neuro PT are. Historically, physical therapists um, tend to be orthopedically trained, so it takes additional training in neurology for one to be deemed a neuro PT. Oftentimes, neuro PTs who have passion in treating Parkinson's disease may go on to get further certification in various modalities of therapy. This would include LSVT Big, Power, Boot Camp, Tai Chi, Yoga, Nordic Track, Rock Steady Boxing. There are a variety of neurophysical therapy programs out there that an orthopedically trained PT may not be aware of or as familiar with. And within our institution, we usually request and require that a referral from neurology uh, to physical therapy happy, happen early on and not when crises develop, that, you, that the physical therapist educate or help educate patients on the utility of exercise and what's the research behind it, that every patient with Parkinson's disease has a physical therapist as part of their core team who they can partner with back and forth through the course of their condition in order to better understand what new structured exercise program may be better suited for them. That therapy can be done in one of two ways, either one-on-one -on -one physical therapy or with the utility of a community-based exercise program. We have found out through uh, these measures that people who perform group exercises, that they have other patients in the same class with them at the same time performing the same exercise is far more motivating than the one-on-one -on -one physical therapy. So once the patient gets that initial baseline with the physical therapist, they then join through our network um, a larger exercise group, maybe consisting of about four to six patients with one physical therapy leading the group. And that group sort of forms an emotional bond. They create a sense of community and they work together to help each other out, giving them empowerment, but at the same time, helping each and every one of them along. And we usually wanna repeat this process at the very minimum, every six months. Oftentimes when we discharge patients from a physical therapy program in Kaiser, we will direct them to a, either a home-based therapy program or an outside community program for them to continue being compliant with their exercise routine. So this brings me to when is it an appropriate time to start medication? Now, mind you, this session is not on Parkinson medications and possible side effects. There are several wonderful talks that can be found on the PDF website under the library of online seminars that addresses just that. But I'd like to start by, I'd like to start by talking about when is it appropriate to start. Is it appropriate at the time of diagnosis? Many general neurologists or primary care physicians assume that, well, a patient's been diagnosed, let's go ahead and start meds. And that's not the way that most movement disorder neurologists uh, think. In fact, most movement disorder neurologists would agree that we should probably start meds only when the patient has functional limitations or functional disability from their Parkinson motor symptoms. And that might be through assessing their disability through what their school or job performance is, or how are they able to get through their activities of daily living. Oftentimes the argument against starting meds is, well, we want to delay possible side effects. We want to delay those motor fluctuations or dyskinesias where people have involuntary movement simply because they're on Parkinson medications or behavioral complications and cognitive impairment because. 
However, there's multiple things that we can do, things that we can recruit from, to be able to mitigate those potential side effects. I think that if you are having functional limitations from your condition now, it is important that you be on appropriate treatment, and that includes meds at some point, and then physical therapy. So for me, I don't go by what the possibility of the future holds uh, with medication side effects. I go by what their uh, current functional limitations are. So this leads me to my last couple of slides. And I want to acknowledge what it means to be an informed patient. The informed and empowered patient will actually seek, on their own, appropriate care. By definition, most people with Parkinson's on the webinar today are informed patients. And usually, well, before I begin, actually, I applaud you for that. There are over a 1,000 people on this webinar now. And I find that quite impressive and endearing as well. So usually informed patients are followed by neurologists. However, interestingly enough, this reflects the minority of the Parkinson population. Now, is that a reflection of uneven health coverage across the region or maybe financial limitations or uneven spread of, of specialists? Well, you know, many specialists tend to sort of congregate in urban areas or near academic centers, leaving a lot of non-urban areas uh, left to generalists. I think some of that has to do with it, but with the advent of telehealth, I think that some of that bridge can be gapped. Sorry, some of that, I'm sorry, some of that gap uh, can be bridged. And as an informed patient, you are in charge of your own destiny. And that means that it's up to you to create a sense of community for yourself. This requires you to have patient ownership and empowerment. It may require you to make tough decisions about when is it appropriate for you to disclose your diagnosis to your employer, to your family, to your loved ones. Do you involve your loved ones in this decision? In my practice, I tend to want patients to be transparent. I think that by doing so, it opens the door for better health later because you already are creating a support network of those who love you. And then in addition to that, connecting with the appropriate local support organizations and resources. You can start with the Parkinson Disease Foundation. In this country, however, there are several other national and local organizations, and internationally, there are quite a few wonderful organizations that dedicate their time to um, helping those uh, afflicted with Parkinson's. That being said, I want to thank the Parkinson Disease Foundation and all of you for allowing me the honor of speaking to you today. Thank you. I guess we'll open it up for questions. Is that right, Jim? That's correct. Thank you, Dr. Kandar. That was a fantastic uh, expert briefing. I mean, I really appreciate uh, the emphasis on, uh, on people with Parkinson's taking charge of their own disease. It's something that we say as a foundation is so important. And also our emphasis on seeing movement disorders neurologists, uh, someone like yourself. Um, we as a foundation are the largest uh, funder and supporter of training of movement disorder neurologists so that we can ensure that through our large centers of excellence and through the training of actual people who take care of people with PD that, that our country is really hopefully blanketed by the, the care that folks need. And Absolutely. what I think is especially nice is that you provided tidbits for people at all stages of their disease. I mean, what you have right now is a, is a fantastic foundation. So with that, um, let me just go on to a couple questions. We've had a number that have come in, and I think uh, some of them are, are really quite interesting. You touched on exercise. And that has been uh, really been, I think, the preponderance of questions we've had from New York, Florida, Texas, California, all over. Is there a particular exercise that you would recommend? Is this something that when you see a physical therapist that they would say, this is the exercise you need to do and, and how much? What, what can you tell us a little bit more about exercise? Great question. Um, oftentimes, I think people get pigeonholed into thinking that there is one particular exercise program for them. And I have expressed with my physical therapist that I work with uh, closely here that everyone requires a tailored approach, which entirely depends on their own personal symptoms. So, for example, what if a patient came in and their biggest limitation from a functional standpoint is manual dexterity? Well, they may require something that really addresses their fine motor movement. Then there are people who come in and they've 
had you know years of frozen shoulder and difficulty getting up from a seated position, which sort of speaks to their rigidity. And so I may want them to perform, you know, Lee Sogelman vocal training big, or maybe power, which is power, which is Parkinson wellness and recovery, because it really addresses that large amplitude movement need. I have many patients who come in who have postural instability. You know, they tend to plop back down in the chair the second they try to get up because there's a delay in their postural response, not allowing them to stand upright. And they may even then have a stoop posture. So they may benefit from a very different type of therapeutic approach. So I would expect that a, a astute physical therapist would do a full assessment, not just of their fine motor movements, but their gross motor movements and their postural movements, and then come up with a strategic plan that might recruit a bit of concepts from rock steady boxing, for example, or maybe a few concepts from Lee Silverman vocal training big, or a few concepts from some other uh, entity, and then tailor a everyday exercise structured program for that particular patient. So again, to reemphasize, there isn't any one particular program for any one particular patient. There's actually going to be multiple concepts that will be tailored to a particular patient based upon their symptomatology. Got it. I think that's a great explanation. And, you know, I think the emphasis on seeing a physical therapist and having them part of your care team is, is brilliant. I mean, it's, it's clear that the benefit of exercise is, is there for a person with Parkinson's. But, you know, here's a, a flip side on that. How does a physical therapist who wants to help people with PD, how do they get involved in a network um, with neurologists in their community so they can get the referrals and help people with PD? What would you suggest to, to those individuals who are listening, the, the professionals on the call? Great question. I oftentimes am for, I forget the fact that within uh, my network and my institution, it's a closed network. So our physical therapists are within our network. But those institutions that don't have that, that rely on community-based physical therapists, I would uh, recommend that those very passionate, very um, expert therapists reach out to local neurology groups and reach out to local academic centers, uh, movement disorder groups that specialize in Parkinson care and partner with them. That's where the passion comes into play. It takes that extra step to make that connection. And I think that everybody in that, every person who receives their care through that connection is gonna benefit from it. Because now those particular neurologists will know who is expert to make that referral to, and then patients feel trusted, uh, or they, they feel more trustworthy of their, of their providers because physician X was able to make a referral to therapist B. Excellent, thank you. So um, that question was from New Jersey, and I have one from California, and that I think you touched on a little bit is the, the diagnostic process. Um, as you mentioned, uh, movement disorder neurologists are, are, are quite astute at, at making this diagnosis, uh, but even amongst the experts, there can be sometimes uncertainty. When does uh, some other tools come into play? I, as you may know, many uh, our audience is well educated and they're, they're well aware of the, this brain imaging approach called DATSCAN. When do you see it being utilized uh, within your own clinic or perhaps um, by someone who doesn't have that advanced training that you have? Wonderful question, and I'm glad somebody brought up the utility of a DATSCAN. At our institution, we certainly have a DATSCAN. Um, we sort of reserve its use uh, for, uh, for someone like me and movement disorders. Um, as opposed to someone in general neurology, because I think oftentimes if a general neurologist is uncertain of a diagnosis, I expect them to make the referral to someone like me. If I am on the border and on the fence of whether somebody truly has Parkinson's um, and I'm, there's not enough clinical evidence to suggest the diagnosis, then I oftentimes will order a DAT scan. Now, what a DAT scan is, for those of you who um, are not familiar with it, it is where uh, we would inject a dye into our bloodstream that has dopamine in it, and then that actually is taken up into the brain, and through nuclear medicine imaging, we're able to measure what that dopamine uptake is. If the dopamine uptake is low or poor, it is highly suggestive of a Parkinson's syndrome, and I'll get back to that in a second. And if the uptake is normal, it is suspicious that the patient does not have Parkinson pathology. Now, that being said, I need the folks on the, on the call to understand that if it is abnormal, you cannot parse out between the various subtypes of Parkinson's. That includes garden variety Parkinson's disease and all the Parkinson plus syndromes. So you still require clinical expertise to be able to tease out 
the nuances of a particular condition to know is that abnormal scan uh, truly abnormal, what does it mean? At the same token, there are scans that are normal that don't provide any evidence of dopaminergic dysfunction. However, the patient clinically actually has Parkinson's disease. So it isn't as simple as just ordering the test and just going by the results. You really have to use it as supportive evidence one way or the other, but not as your only evidence one way or the other of having Parkinson's. Fantastic. So once you know, we have that certainty of diagnosis, I, I know some people, um, especially early in their PD, they, they don't necessarily always have the confidence to help disambiguate what their symptoms might be. And we've had a couple questions come in, one from Iowa, for instance, trying to understand uh, about pain and Parkinson's disease. Another one's asking a little bit about lightheadedness. As part of this care team that you've suggested that people establish, wh whom should they go see first about some of these issues? Um, lightheadedness, you know, which can be dizziness, it can lead to falls, and that's kind of scary. So what, what would you suggest, Dr. Kandar? So this gets a bit complicated. If somebody does not have a diagnosis of Parkinson's and they develop lightheadedness, I think that your primary care physician would be your best filter as to what that potentially could mean. And I would expect the primary care physician to, at the very least, evaluate their blood pressure in both a seated and a standing position. It's a very common cause of lightheadedness as we all get older. However, if somebody already has a diagnosis of Parkinson's and starts developing certain symptoms that they're not quite sure is related to their Parkinson's or not, in my experience, I usually want them to ask me as the neurologist or the movement disorder neurologist simply because oftentimes, given the demands that our primary care um, physicians have on their, on their panel, it might be difficult for them to make the effort to tease out what this may or may not be. And I think that because neurologists or movement disorder neurologists are better aware of what, you know, sort of uh, side symptoms that patients with Parkinson's can have, we probably can filter that easier, quicker, and with more direction. So it depends on if you already have a diagnosis of PD or not. Okay, great. So in a similar vein, the question from California is asking about sleep. Um, it's particularly about sleep medications and if they're on ready to start PD medications. Is there something they need to be concerned about? Again, is this you know, so often sleep issues you might talk to your primary care physician about? Is this something you would go talk to your movement disorder neurologist about? The answer is yes, because I think sleep is very complicated in Parkinson's disease. It isn't usually just one problem. It's usually a constellation of problems. So to give you a kind of a sort of a broad overview, sleep and Parkinson's could be related to stiffness. You can't toss and turn. You don't ever feel like you had a good restful sleep. Sleep could be related to having increased urinary frequency, requiring you to get up multiple times in the middle of the night. Sleep could be because you are so fatigued during the day, taking naps during the day that you're sabotaging your night, now you can't fall asleep. Sleep could actually be related to something as simple as poor sleep hygiene. We all tend to hover around our mobile devices at night and watch, and all the best shows on TV happen to come on nighttime and those are very activating, sometimes even more so in an individual with Parkinson's rather than someone who doesn't. And when it becomes activating, it's very hard to fall asleep. And sleep could also very well be related to those two conditions that I mentioned in my, in my presentation, the REM sleep behavior disorder or the restless legs. So it takes a neurologist, a movement disorder neurologist, or even a sleep specialist to actually be able to figure out what are the main components um, and reasons behind why a particular individual is not being able to fall asleep or stay asleep. And so the answer isn't sometimes as easy as just simply giving a sleep aid. That sometimes can actually smother the problem initially, but then you start to brew a fire later. That's fascinating. I think it's a really good point. Um, and I think it opens up a, a, a bigger question, I, which, of course, is where we're, we want to go, of course, and, and leading one, another one from uh, California is how do you determine – I mean, we've talked about sleep. You, you should talk to your um, movement disorder neurologist. They are talking about lightheadedness, talking to your movement disorder neurologist. So how do you determine what are the questions to go to you for versus your primary care physician? I mean, how, does, how do you make that, give that confidence to people to be able to understand a bit more about their disease? It's a great question, and oftentimes I think patients don't want to necessarily overburden any one particular provider. Um, and, and this is where I think the development of a care team becomes important because I think
think there would be a respected understanding between members of that care team that, look, this patient, just like any other patient with a chronic condition, is going to have a lot of questions. And if you have an established care team that routinely communicates with each other, maybe not necessarily in person, but at least by uh, virtually, then I can always feel the question to somebody else if it's not something that I can manage myself. I don't think patients should ever feel reserved about asking questions because it pertains to their health care. It pertains to their what's most dear to them. So I wouldn't mind at all if every single one of my patients, every single time they actually had something that was they weren't quite sure what it was related to, to have fielded it through me first, I can always, you know, uh, send that to the primary care physician if it's not necessarily under, you know, my uh, scope of skills. Thank you, Dr. Kandar. So a, another question that's come in, and I, I think what we're hearing uh, from you is, again, the importance of a patient taking charge of their disease, but uh, someone from Ohio asks uh, about their, their father who is depressed, or as you well aware that many people with Parkinson's sometimes develop apathy, and they don't have that kind of that gumption, if you will, um, because of the, of the course of their disease to, to take charge. How does, a, how does someone who's somewhat on the periphery, maybe they're a care partner, maybe they're a loved one, um, advocate for their, their, their family member, the, the, the person with Parkinson's, to, to get the uh, uh, care team that they need. How do you help enable uh, breaking down this, this medical hierarchy? A wonderful question. Um, so first of all, to address apathy, I find it to be one of the most challenging things to treat in Parkinson's because when a patient themselves are not having the motivation that they need to do better for themselves, yet they understand they have to do certain things that are to better themselves, it's, it's quite frustrating on everybody's end, but also quite challenging at the same time. And there really isn't any one good answer as to how to approach somebody who has apathy or that lack of motivation. Now, somebody on the periphery can absolutely uh, help their, their loved one, and that's going to be through taking the reins themselves for a little while before they can pass it back to their, to their loved one. So I, it's not uncommon for patients' loved ones to actually approach me through email or through phone saying that I think that my loved one needs an appointment or I think that there's something going on that requires mental health intervention. Um, this is actually also why these group exercise programs work because you're utilizing the strength of the whole group and it's not really one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so the momentum of the group sometimes can pull somebody out of that apathetic situation. This is why rock steady boxing actually fares so well. You, you know, I have so many of my patients who are in that program that were very apathetic going in and coming out of it, eager to go back the next time. So, but sometimes it does take somewhat of a uh, of an act of uh, of God to be able to pull that person out of that apathetic situation. And oftentimes, caregivers, loved ones. The, uh, care partners need to take uh, the reins into their own hands. I sometimes would um, uh, sort of ask that the care partner also, you know, get their hands dirty and, and, and do the same exercise routine that their loved one is going to do um, in order to make the loved one feel that there's someone else doing it with them. So, you know, a lot of these exercise programs that are out there, the, the loved one is also just alongside, right there with them, doing the same routine, and that somehow gives motivation and strength to, to the patient. Yeah, that's a really great point. I, we've seen that with uh, studies we've funded, uh, for instance, looking at Tango, that that social aspect and having uh, both partners there can be really uh, so incredibly beneficial uh, in, in increasing the, the outcomes and the, and the, and the quality that uh, people experience from these types of interventions. Um, I, I'm just going to just interject real quick just to let uh, our listeners know that we have a survey online that's on your screen. And just to let you know that our, your feedback here is something that we take very seriously, and it really helps us to improve our webinars. Um, we rely upon our listeners, uh, participants in this webinar, to help create the next series. So please feel free to, to give this uh, uh, a survey a, a, a good look and, and provide some responses so that we can um, uh, not only provide feedback for us internally, but you know, Dr. Kandar likes to uh, know how he's done. And I'll have to say, Dr. Kandar, that uh, many people are contemplating moving to where you are for your for their PD treatment. They love your love your talk um, so well, far. Thank you. I appreciate that. Those are kind yeah, of it's, it, it's been fantastic. So one of the things that we're coming through, and we're, especially when we talk about um, question-wise, especially when we talk about someone who's been newly diagnosed with PD, 
they're often um, frequently there's people who are working and they have families to support and there, there's a complexity there so I, I think about this care team um, who would you recommend upon that group to help uh, people who've been newly diagnosed and I, I think clearly that there's issues about the the visibility of PD symptoms, and, and maybe if you can just touch again a little bit on how you might approach a, someone who's a, maybe a young onset uh, um, for their treatment. But I'm also thinking about oftentimes um, there can be uh, cognitive uh, changes for a person with Parkinson's who, who, who still needs to work. Is there a specialist uh, um, who can really help them in order to navigate uh, the working world while um, they, they still are working? I think a lot of that depends on the patient's workplace. You know, how receptive are they to a diagnosis like Parkinson's? Oftentimes patients don't feel comfortable actually disclosing that diagnosis in fear that they may have to scale back their work or they may uh, not be able to work in the same capacity simply because they told their employer that they have this diagnosis. So I usually, you know, have patients want to think about it first, about what all the ramifications are of disclosing that diagnosis, number one certainly recruiting the help of their loved ones. But this is where sometimes healthcare needs to understand that we need two important people for someone with young onset Parkinson's because I do believe it's a more complicated condition than someone who develops it a little bit later in life because there's so many more components here. One is the movement disorder specialist. This is one of those instances where maybe the general neurologist is not enough because the movement disorder neurologist may have more options for that patient when it comes to which treatment program might be better, what might be able to give that patient better motor benefit, um, are they maybe earlier candidates for things like deep brain stimulation that can allow them to continue working, um, things, things of that nature. They certainly, of course, need their physical therapist, and then also the second person would be the, uh, a social worker, a case manager. The, the Parkinson specialist, the movement disorder neurologist, may not be able to understand all the nuances of what that patient is going through, but a social worker may be able to better navigate um, what that patient's needs are both, you know, at the workplace and at home, as well as their own medical needs, and how does all tie together. In my institution, that's not something that we've fully adopted just yet, and I think that we're gravitating towards that, and I'm hopeful that a lot of other institutions um, are doing the same. But having a social worker, a roadmap, a guide to kind of help with that younger onset population and even, you know, older patients if necessary, um, I think would be very helpful. Just because I think a lot of patients, once they get that diagnosis, that are lost in the thinking towards the future. Yeah, that's a very good point. I mean, it's, I think, hearing you speak, it's, it's very clear that there's a lot of things people have to be hopeful for. And by forming this team, it really ensures that they're able to. Um, tackle this disease in a, in a, with a group around them that can help them function the best they can for as long as they can. And I, I imagine that could be for quite some time. Um, is there any advice uh, as far as the progression of disease you could give to, to someone who's newly diagnosed? When, when someone you tell someone who's been newly diagnosed, you're, you're diagnosing them themselves. I mean, I'm sure a question gets asked, what does this mean? What does my future hold? Can you give any insight to that? I, you know, first, um, you know, I, I think that as as uh, providers, we have to understand that there's a certain degree of sympathy and empathy that we have to be able to express when we make that diagnosis. There's a there's an art to it, just as much as there is an art to anything else that we do in the medical world or in the non medical world, for that matter. So I think that I implore that all providers out there that are on this call, um, you know, take this with a with a certain degree of empathy that you're diagnosing a chronic condition. You're diagnosing a condition that patients will likely have for the rest of their life. But at the same time, be able to express that this is a chronic condition no different than other chronic conditions, like diabetes, for example, and that now it requires a certain amount of vigilance, a certain amount of monitoring, a certain amount of connectivity with your care providers, and, of course, establishing that, that care team. You don't necessarily want to throw all of that at the patient on that first round, it's like I sometimes like to tell my patients that, you know, you only want to say and do so much on the first date. You might want to leave that for the second date. Um, but the other thing is that um, I usually want to express to patients that the condition no longer has the same faux pas or taboo that it used to, maybe even just 10 years ago, that there are so many more treatments, so many more options, a greater understanding about how exercise and 
being active, both mentally and physically, can actually shape and, and change the trajectory of this condition. And if my patient goes home with a new diagnosis, but also with that clarity that being active and not allowing this to redefine them and, and being uh, and exercising and developing a care team that's going to support them and they are trusting of that, I assure you they're going to go home feeling much better than they might have if they had that diagnosis 10 years ago. I think you're right. That's fantastic. Um, so just shifting gears a little bit, I mean, because I, I, I think don't want to uh, make it entirely lose the, the, the momentum you have about that hope, but it, it just getting to more, some more pragmatic issues and questions are coming through. Um, a question from Candace was asking about uh, nutrition. Um, do you advise patients uh, to change their eating habits? Uh, I've heard uh, in studies that Mediterranean diets or variation thereof seems to be uh, of most benefit. Is, is, that, is, is it as simple as that? Or, um, I, what I don't think tell? it's as simple as that. I think that we have to take a hard look at our own diets. I think that um, you know traditional diets, uh, depending on your ethnicity and your background, have changed, right? Um, you know, I'm of, uh, of of Indian origin, and I'm pretty sure that hamburgers and pizza are not part of the traditional Indian diet. But yet, being in the states, I think that's you know kind of what we tend to gravitate towards sometimes. Um, so I think we have to take a hard look at our own personal diets and start taking out certain things that we know are not good for us, and start relying more on you know, drinking more water, cutting out that soda, reducing the sugar intake, and really focusing on more fibrous type foods such as raw fruits and raw vegetables. I think that in, a, in and of itself can help us make us feel better and improve constipation and sleep patterns. Then moving towards a more specific type of dietary program, um, oftentimes the Mediterranean diet has been lauded as one of the best diets in the world. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that many people who live in those areas tend to lead healthier lives and live longer. In fact, the Mediterranean area is considered one of the blue spots in the world, uh, which basically means that their dietary uh, practices are better than most. In the reality, they're eating more natural foods. They're eating more organic-type foods, and everything is in moderation. Um, so we're not overindulging on any one particular item. But being able to tell a particular patient that this specific dietary program is best for Parkinson's disease, I don't think we're there yet because nutritional studies are very difficult. Um, it's very hard for governing research bodies to sit there and try to do randomized controlled trials with, with nutrition. I know that on your seminars um, from PDF a couple years ago, Heather Zwicky from Portland, Oregon, had given a talk on, uh, on nutrition, and there are several other talks from other leading experts across uh, in the field on this, and I think that they provide some insights. But again, I would, I would imagine that they all would collectively agree that there isn't any one particular dietary program. But the first step is to look at your own dietary patterns and how could you improve that uh, to what you know is a better dietary, uh, um, to what is better dietary intake rather than what you're already doing? I, I think that's a really good point. So it, it's, it sounds like it's just um, eating healthy, and uh, as you pointed out, uh, these issues regarding the gut, the constipation, can be so uh, debilitating in, in addressing them with a, a proper diet of, of whole foods and, and lots of um, fibrous foods can be really beneficial. And well, I think this, that gets this, to an, an, this, this sorry. Goes back to the point about, you know, a yeah. lot of people, including myself, believe that maybe Parkinson's, you know, what we're seeing by the time we make a diagnosis is now, of course, reserved to the brain, but where did the condition actually start? Did it start in the brain or did it actually start in the gut? Is there a change in gut absorption and, you know, sort of colonic flora that has caused us to only absorb certain things in the body and maybe weed out other things simply because our gut is not viable to that? And did that ultimately lead to the pathology of, of Parkinson's? I don't think we have the right answers just yet, but I do think it's part of the process. So I think the gut is going to have a lot of answers for us, but I'm not sure we're, we're ready to give some global uh, recommendations just yet. I have a gut feeling that you may be right. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry, it's awful. But uh, so I, I think you've touched on a, a, a the point, which is how do PD, the PD symptoms, I mean, it seems like uh, from what we're talking about and, and certainly from what I, I know, it would be nice to hear what you, your thoughts are on, do they appear before the diagnosis? I mean, we're talking about, uh, when you talked about REM behavior sleep disorder, um, people having sleep issues, they're having uh, loss of smell, uh, constipation. What kind of symptoms are, 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 are present before that diagnosis? So, you know, I mentioned in my, my in my presentation that 
historically and traditionally, and most commonly, we make a diagnosis only when somebody develops the motor symptoms. Can we get to a place to where we can make a diagnosis before the motor symptoms come on? And ultimately, would that lead to a change in trajectory of how the condition is going to go based upon any kind of treatment plan that we put in place before they develop the motor symptoms? And I think we're not there yet, but I think we will soon be there. And we've already identified these four common preclinical non-motor signs, the, the uh, anosmia, or loss of sense of smell, the constipation, the REM sleep behavior disorder, and, and you know, some of the, the anxiety or, or depression. And we're not far from getting to a point where we can couple those four things and it will alert somebody, i.e. primary care physician to make a referral to neurology or a neurologist, and then have a coupling biomarker that goes, yep, with these four potential preclinical non-motor signs and this biomarker that's positive, you have X likelihood of developing Parkinson's disease, so let's implement this particular program that will help to thwart that or change the trajectory of developing that. Um, we're not there yet, but I don't think we're too far from there. I certainly hope that is the case. Uh, I know that we and many other organizations are working to try to make progress on that. And I want to appreciate uh, your time, Dr. Kondar. We went a little bit over, and I, I hopefully uh, we didn't lose too many of our, our listeners as, as part of that. Um, I also want to thank, uh, uh, again, AbV, uh, KD Pharmaceuticals, and Lundbeck for making this series possible. Without their support, uh, financial support, this would not be uh, – we wouldn't have this conversation today. What a wonderful afternoon uh, to spend with you, Dr. Kandar. Thank you um, I want to let, Yeah. I, I also want to let our listeners know that if you want to go back or if you have friends who didn't, weren't able to make uh, this uh, webinar by Dr. Kandar, that we're going to make an archive available beginning March 14th. That's uh, next week, next Tuesday, March 14th. And you can go to pdf.org for that um, archive to, to take a look at. Um, we also have another webinar in our series that's going to be coming up in the middle of April, uh, Tuesday, April 18th, same time, 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern time, and it's going to be by Dr. Lawrence Sievert. He's going to talk about uh, his talk, Is It Related to PD? Um, runny Noses, Skin Changes, and Overlooked PD Symptoms. So I think it's a, a, a nice segue from our conversation with Dr. Kendar today into the one with Dr. Sievert uh, in April. So, uh, again, Thank you, Dr. Kandar, and thank you again to our community for your time today and listening. Thank you.